Prayer is something that we think about often, but I wonder if we really think about it, how much of our day is spent in prayer. I was looking at the Ellen White estate, and there was a daily devotion that kind of got me thinking. It says, solemnly, there come to us down through the centuries the warning words of our God from the Mount of Olives. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life. And so that day come on you unawares. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all of these things and that shall come pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So right now, let's pray again. Dear Father in heaven, we come before you with hearts that are troubled in this time of trouble. We come before you needing to hear your words again and again to give us peace, to give us strength, to, to strengthen our faith. And today, Father, we come to hear your words from you. So we pray that as this message is presented, that your words will be firm, they will be sure, they will be encouraging, and they will be true. Bless us now with your presence and with our thoughts and everything we do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful? Can we find a friend so faithful who will take our sorrows and share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden? Are we cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou wilt find solace there. The title of this chapter in the book, Steps to Christ, is called The Privilege of Prayer. And this song came to my mind because it's, oh, what privilege we share. What a privilege to carry, I'm sorry. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. So... I want us to think today about this privilege, about prayer, naturally. We've heard so many things about prayer through the years, but let's start at the very beginning again and why we need prayer. You see, in God's desire for fellowship, he created beings in his image. He wanted someone that he could provide everything for. He was going to give them a home. Actually, it was intended for us. He was going to give us food that we can't even imagine how good it was. He was going to give us a family. 
He was going to give us friends. He was going to meet every single need. He was going to share his goodness and his blessings with those who he created. Above all of those things, though, he really wanted someone to love. And someone to love him back. Now, he had the angels. They adored him. But he wanted to create someone new. Someone else who had been created in his image. In Matthew, Jesus talks about this fellowship in a different way. But he says... Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And by the way, this is Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 and 29. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. Now you're like, what's that scripture have to do with prayer? Well, all that God does for us is so that we might learn who he is. And when we come to him and allow him to take our burdens away, that's fellowship. It's a different kind of fellowship than we normally think. But it's a working fellowship, working together. To learn of God is more, though, than just taking information. Certainly God wants to communicate with us. He wants to teach us about who he is. His spirit is constantly speaking to us through his word, through nature, through the blessings that he gives us, through the providences that we see. He shares with us so many things. But in the book Steps to Christ, we see this statement. In order to have spiritual life and energy, now, I want you to think about this. Do you want spiritual life and energy? A lot of us are tired a lot. <laughs> and we want energy. But we don't want just energy to go out and run a marathon. We want energy to work for God. Amen. So, in order to have spiritual life and spiritual energy, we must have an actual relationship with our Heavenly Father. Our minds may be drawn out toward Him. We may meditate upon His works, His mercies, His blessings, but this is not the fullest sense communing, not in the fullest sense communing with him. In order to commune with God, we must have something to say to him concerning our actual life. In this sense, prayer becomes more personal to us with our relationship with God. God becomes more personal to us because we're talking to Him. We would never think of trying to make a friend and just walking up to them and looking at them. Or even going up to them and just standing there listening to them. Okay, I want to know you better, so I'm going to listen to you. Where's, where is that going to lead, this relationship? God wants to hear from us. He wants to hear from you individually. He wants a conversation about anything that you want to discuss. He wants to hear about your needs our sorrows, our ups and downs, 
the blessings we receive, the happy events in our lives, he really likes it when we say thank you. Now, God doesn't need us to tell him what our needs are or what our desires are or what our wants are. He just wants the opportunity. Actually, he wants to give us the opportunity to come to him. You see, prayer doesn't bring God to us. Prayer brings us to God. Jesus came to this earth to show us who the Father was. He came to this earth to show us how to relate to him, how to live a life that would reveal him to others. To do that, we need to know who we're talking about. He taught his disciples to pray for their needs. He taught them to cast their cares upon the supplier of all their needs, the infinite supplier at that. He wanted them to see how they could have complete assurance in his supply of their need. Paul describes the Father this way. This is in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Paul says, Now unto him that is able. Able means he can do it, right? Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power of that worketh within us. Can you think of anyone else that you would rather go to to resolve a need? Can you think of anyone else that you would think of first when a problem comes along? That's kind of a a double-sided question. Because if you can't think of someone, then in practice, who do you go to first? I would admit, most of the time I go to myself first. Because my wife says I'm a fixer. I think I know how to do this. But I come up short quite often. Christ not only taught his disciples to pray by reciting a prayer for them, but he taught them how to pray by living their life for him. Jesus, the Son of God, took on humanity to show us how to be strengthened for the times that come. He knew that there would be a controversy within us. He knew that there would be controversy around us. He knew that we couldn't handle it by ourselves. So Jesus came to show us how to do this. And he did it by becoming a man like us. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verse 15, tells us about Jesus. He was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. How could we figure out how to do that without an example? Without the Son of God coming to show us how to do that? 
the ability to live without sin came through the prayer life that Jesus himself had. Again, Steps to Christ tells us this. His humanity made prayer a necessity and a privilege. He found comfort and joy in communion with his Father. And if the Savior of men, the Son of God, felt the need of prayer, how much more should Bill Plank feel the necessity of fervent, constant prayer? Now, really, my name's not in there. But my character is. It really says, how much more should feeble, sinful mortals feel the necessity of fervent, constant prayer. Our Heavenly Father waits to bestow upon us the fullness of His blessing. It is our privilege to drink largely at the fountain of boundless love. Are you thirsty? As our brother takes a drink of water. God has the resource that we need to satisfy that thirst. What a wonder it is that we pray so little. God is ready and willing to hear the sincere prayer of the humblest of his children. And yet there is much manifest reluctance on our part to make known our wants to God. What can the angels of heaven think of poor, helpless human beings who are subject to temptation when God's heart of infinite love yearns toward them, ready to give them more than they can ask or think. And yet they pray so little and have so little faith. The angels love to bow before God. They love to be near Him. They regard communion with God as their highest joy. And yet the children of earth who need so much help that God only can give seem satisfied to walk without the light of his spirit, the companionship of his presence. You know, I recognize that I have a guardian angel. And sometimes I apologize to him because of my attitude or because of what I've done. And he has to stand there and watch me do it because he's not going to force me not to. But God's desire is that we will come to him and not want to do those things. Prayer is a tool to help accomplish that. God is ready and willing to hear the sincere prayer, he says. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing if you think about it uh, that we have a connection with the source of all happiness. We have a connection with the the person who will gladly give up whatever it is to make us happy. But we don't understand that. First of all, we may feel that we're too sinful to come to God. We may feel that He is not willing, and sometimes it might cross our minds that He's not able to forgive us anymore. We think He's not able to do what He said He could do. 
because our focus, our sight is on us instead of him. Secondly, we may be so entrenched in our struggles here on this world that we forget about him. I have this list of things to do, and if I don't get it done by this date, it's going to be bad. So how am I going to do that? And we leave God outside. Still more than that, maybe we've walked away from him. Maybe we've forgotten how he has loved us in the past, how he has taken care of us in the past. But we see that Jesus, who became sin for us, as it says in 1 Corinthians 5, 21, that we might be made righteousness, the righteousness of God in him, we don't recognize the gift of the salvation that he's provided for us. And the hope that comes with that Now, we've, we're talking a little bit about prayer and the, the actual communion with God, talking to him in person, personally. But how can we really be sure that our prayers are answered? We hear quite often testimonies of answered prayers And yet, my prayer may not be answered. At least I don't see the answer. One of those stories where prayers are being answered, and I say are being answered because the end is not yet defined, but there is a gentleman in the state of Washington who has COVID. And last week, he was, his family was told he's not going to make it. It's over. Can't do anything more. So the Adventist Prayer Network, you know what that is, right? That's me calling you, calling someone else, calling. I don't know how many people are praying for him. A thousand? more. By the end of last week, he was off the ventilator. Amen. He was starting to eat. And he's moved to a regular hospital room right now. Amen. Eating more, taking it easy. Prayer works. The doctors who had committed him to, to a certain death now recognize a miracle happening. We have been participants in that prayer. So we can say our prayers are answered, but are they always answered? We can look at the life of Jesus with regard to prayers, but not just his own prayers, prayers that he describes and talks about. For instance, one day Jesus and the disciples are standing near the temple, and they see a man walk up to the corner of the main street there, so everyone can see, and he begins to pray. You know the story. He says, God, I thank you that I'm not like the rest of these men. And he goes on to delineate the things that they do and he doesn't do. And then he talks about the things he does. Do 
Did God hear that prayer? God has ears, doesn't he? But the man didn't ask for anything. So what's God supposed to do about this prayer? If the man had asked for something based on what we see of his character, it would have been selfishness that he asked for. Then they look over and in a, a little corner where not many people can see him is another man. And this man cannot even bring himself to raise his eyes up to heaven. He pours out his heart, a different heart than the first man. He pours out his heart and says, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Which prayer was accepted of God? Which prayer had the power to change someone's heart? It is true the book Steps to Christ tells us that if we hold on to a cherished sin, if we will not give it up for any reason, God will not hear our prayers. That doesn't mean that the words won't reach him. It means that we won't get what we're asking for. The publican sought God's will for his life. I don't know how many of you know or knew Richard O'Phil. He wrote a book on prayer. But one of the things he said that always remains with me is God always wants to say yes. And he likens it to a man coming home from work. And he asks his wife, do you want to go out to eat tonight? Is she going to say no? <laughs> so when we ask God, if we're asking him for his will, for the things he wants for us, He's not going to say no. If I say, Father, forgive me and help me to repent of this sin that I just can't beat, He wants to help me. He wants to forgive me. So He's going to put His efforts there. Jesus taught us about doing the Father's will, right? In John chapter 5, verse 30, Jesus says, I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. And who can forget the Garden of Gethsemane? The prayer to his Father in heaven when he had no one else to go to, his disciples were asleep. They weren't going to help him through this. The rest of the world seemingly wanted him out of the picture. Where does he go but to his father? And he prays the prayer but he concludes it with, not my will, but thine be done. In God's graciousness and mercy, he sometimes may not answer the prayer we want. 
But when we say, thy will be done, how many of you are excited to see how he will answer that prayer? Because he has ways that we have no imagination to accept. We have had the personal experience with God answering our prayers, not the way we expected. I'm here today because God put me here, not the way I expected. Why should sons and daughters of God, not just my sons and daughters, not just your sons and daughters, but God's sons and daughters, why should they be reluctant to pray? When prayer is the key to heaven, that faith unlocks the door. Where are the treasured? Where are the boundless resources of omnipotence? Without unceasing prayer and diligent watching, we're in danger of growing careless and deviating from the path that God's leading us on. The adversary seeks continually to obstruct the way to mercy. Our earnest supplication and faith is what it takes to obtain that grace and power to resist temptation. And yet again, as available as it is to us, we don't avail ourselves of it as often as we should. Another aspect of prayer that will bring light to our mind and enjoyment Enjoyment not just to us, but also specifically to God, is the practice of praising Him for who He is. Praising Him for what He has done for us. Amen. Praising Him for what He has promised to do. In Steps to Christ, again, it tells us we need to praise God more for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Our devotional exercises should not consist wholly in asking and receiving. It doesn't say we can't ask for things, but that shouldn't be the whole theme of our discussion with Jesus with the Father. Let us not be always thinking of our wants and never of the benefits we've received. We do not pray any too much, but we are too sparing of giving thanks. We are the constant recipients of God's mercies, and yet how little gratitude we express, how little we praise him for what he has done for us. I have, through the years, with the raising of my three children, heard many times an elder of the group say, say thank you when they receive a gift. 
certainly they need to be taught gratitude. But one of the best ways for children to be taught gratitude is to see their parents thanking God, praising God, praying to God, communing with God. To learn by example, we've heard many times, is the best way. Still, again, in the book Steps to Christ. It says, We need to praise God more for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. I just read that. But it goes on. And it says, the soul may ascend nearer heaven on the wings of praise. God is worshipped with song and music in the courts above. And as we express our gratitude, we are approximating to the worship of the heavenly hosts. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth God. Psalm fifty twenty three. Let us with reverent joy come before our Creator with thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Isaiah 51.3 tells us that. We never have enough time to share the things that God is bringing to us. I feel like I have barely scratched the information in this chapter. So I'm going to make a request of you. The chapter talks about relationships with each other and how our prayer life can bring us to come to other people and talk about God and what he's doing in our lives when we have a meeting with each other, maybe we have dinner with someone or, or visit someone's home, what's our conversation about? Is it about how God has blessed us this week? Is it about what God is doing in my life? Or is it about my trials and my troubles and I just can't get through this? Now, I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't talk to our friends about some of those things. The right friends can help us through troubles and trials by helping us remember to go to God. But the faith that comes from a faithful friend is something that is a blessing more often than not more than we understand. We can use prayer as a shield against sin but that's more than just a statement that I don't have time to go into. the confidence and the faith that prayer can bring us in our Father is a tool that each of us can use. But again, we need to study that out and recognize it in our own lives to personally relate to that. I don't have time. But I know where there's a resource that you can use to go and see these things in your own 
language, in your own time. And maybe, since it's so hot out today, maybe this afternoon might be a good time to sit down and read the 10th chapter in Steps to Christ. The name of that chapter is The Privilege of Prayer. You will be convicted if you open your heart. God will come in and he will show you what prayer can do for you personally. If you want the best gift, oh, it's chapter 11. The chapters in my book don't have numbers. <laughs> God has given us the gift of prayer. And it's our privilege to accept that gift, to use that gift, to learn more about Him, to bring our petitions to Him and learn more about ourselves. May God bless each of us as we try to use prayer more faithfully than we've done in the past. May we not be the one who says or is said of us that we pray too little. Most Holy Heavenly Father, we can't even imagine the gifts that you have for us. But the gift of prayer is something that we can practice right now here on this earth. And Father, we want to know you better. We want to be able to talk to you, to converse with you, to commune with you. We want to be able to see why things are happening to us. We want to be able to know the future. And while some of those things are not for our time, you still want to hear about our day. You want to hear about our thoughts and our needs and our reactions to our family and to our friends and to the troubles that we have. Father, you want to hear everything about us. We don't even want to hear everything about our family, Father. Change our hearts. Create a new heart within us. Bring us a right spirit. And turn our thoughts and our minds to you so that we will want the best for our family. We will want to be with them always. We will want to hear everything about their day. And Father, may we, through our communion with you, be able to help finish this work so that Jesus can come back to take us home. Forgive us for our sins. Put a new heart within us. And may Jesus come soon, we pray in his name. Amen.